welcome back! My name is Baller Scuba. This is Video Games Over Time! We are still in 1985, and today we're going to talk about our retrospective on 1985. We're going to talk about the year as a whole. Uh, we don't get to do this too often. It's basically just once a year now, but basically this is going to be a channel update. It's much more relaxed. We're going to talk about kind of how the year went, some things that I learned, some things that... Uh, I just kind of want to talk about when it comes to a larger picture, and I want to do it in a more relaxed environment. So we're going to try to make it relaxed here. Uh, I do have uh, kind of my stream set up. Uh, apparently the software that I was using for streaming is discontinued, so I had to kind of cobble this together. I do have some lights on me. Uh, the sun is strong and it is out today, so there's not too much I can do about that. Hopefully it goes away. Uh, the room's a bit of a mess. I do have the dog with me. Ruby is over there. Hopefully going to sleep because that'll make it easiest for me to record. And the cat is outside, so hopefully no noises there. But um, ultimately there's a lot that we want to talk about. I'll start with kind of the more uh, official uh, project type stuff, and then we'll get into more personal stuff later. Uh, I have been very busy in my personal life. Just growing this has taken so much time. Uh, but before we get into uh, the personal stuff, let's talk about the, the project as a whole. Uh, I always kind of start these with basically the list of topics that we've talked about uh, this year and kind of my personal history with it and kind of a brief summary of how it went. Uh, we'll start with the first topic, which was Gradius. Uh, Gradius, let me move these over. Uh, Gradius was uh, a game that I always wanted to play, but never really got the chance to. Uh, so I'm happy that this project kind of exists. That's kind of the point of the project sometimes is for me to kind of explore a game that I never really got to, but always wanted to. And this kind of gave me the excuse. Uh, the game is hard. The game was very hard. I, would, I knew I was not going to be good at it. I'm not very good at shooters. Apparently horizontal is much worse for me than, than vertical. So uh, Gradius, I was glad that we did, uh, but that was difficult. Uh, next up, Mercenary. I hadn't heard of Mercenary before I started this project. And playing it, I can see why the potential for a great game is there, but it also really felt empty. Uh, that game is beloved, as far as I can tell, over in Europe and especially England, but uh, never really translated over here to America. I can kind of see why, but um, I did have fun. It just mm, need, it needs some fine tune in there. Uh, next up is Paperboy. Paperboy is a game that I have, I believe, played before. If I had, it was just in small increments. Also a very difficult game. You don't think it should be that difficult because you are playing as a Paperboy, just kind of delivering papers and, I don't know, just didn't feel like a, a game that should be as difficult as it, as it actually turned out to be. Uh, but uh, I had fun playing that one that it's one of those ones once again that I wanted to actually sit down and play and even having done that it doesn't necessarily feel like I did but we did go through that a lot of topics this time uh next up is Twin B Twin B is kind of one of those underground shooting franchises uh that I had heard about and some people had you know tried to tell me about and I never got around to it so I was happy to play this one. Um, it's it's very Japanese. There's a lot going on. Uh, you have very bright colors and things like that. Uh, and it's difficult. It's still a difficult game. Uh, next up we have uh, Paradroid. Paradroid's an interesting one for me because I had never heard of it before. Um, the game is interesting. Um, but when I looked it up... the what I saw online really overhyped it. Uh, and so I, I couldn't help but feel disappointed with the game as I played it. There's, and that has nothing to really do with the game itself. The game is good. The game's fine. Um, but uh, when I went online, they basically said it was the best Commodore 64 game of all time. And I disagree with that. That 
that didn't translate for me. So, like I said, it was going to be disappointing kind of no matter what, but um, I had fun with that. And once again, a lot of people really seem to like Paradroid, uh, but it just didn't do it for me. Uh, next up, we have uh, one of several intro videos we did this year. This was a packed year. Uh, the first intro video that we did was our intro to professional wrestling. Um, I'm actually a big professional wrestling fan. Uh, I watch weekly shows, and I I grew up watching it uh, on and off. Uh, but I have gone back and watched the old stuff that would have been around in 1985. So I'm a big professional wrestling fan. Uh, it is a guilty pleasure of mine. I don't talk about it too often, but I yet yeah, I I watch not only the the major company. I don't want to spoil two things, but I also watch the other major company and the major foreign company. And like I I watch a lot of wrestling, so. I, I do know it. Hopefully I explained it well. Uh, I didn't get too many comments on that one, but what I did see was people basically trying to justify professional wrestlers that were bad people. Yeah, there it was weird. But um, keep in mind, I, I, do, I do put it kind of at the end of a lot of those types of videos, those intro videos, that uh, these are not necessarily role models and especially in professional wrestling they are playing a character on screen and sometimes the person behind that character is very different and sometimes they are eerily close and ultimately uh there are reasons that uh certain people behind the scenes and in front of the scenes um are not necessarily the the people you want to idolize um and and we keep on hearing more stories lately um like right now about major characters that i've already talked about in that video since i made that video lots more terrible things about these people have come to light um kind of already had a an idea about it but uh, just keep that in mind that professional wrestling mm, Hard to talk about it um, uh, without talking about some controversies. Uh, then the the professional wrestling game that we played, which was Matt Mania, the Pro Wrestling Network. Uh, I, I think when I started, that wasn't the, the first pro wrestling game I, I planned on doing, uh, but it ended up kind of working out that way. It was an okay wrestling game. Nothing spectacular about it. Uh, I do remember at the time thinking, hey, this is probably based on the Von Erichs, which I didn't really even talk about in my intro video, but... Uh, since then, there's been a movie released about the, the Von Erichs, so it's probably more obvious to a lot of people now. Uh, but, you know, it's always interesting to me to see the unlicensed uh, video games, and uh, Matt Mania is one. It, it didn't get a license from uh, the, the, the major wrestling promotions or the, the wrestlers themselves, and see how they kind of twist and turn the characters into something slightly different and Matt Mania did that a lot and I found that interesting. Uh, but yeah, it wasn't on my radar when we started, but I'm glad that I played it. Uh, next up we have Commando. Uh, Commando is one, once again, one of those legendary games that I've always heard about and just kind of need an excuse to get around to playing and it's fun. Uh, you know, it's essentially a running gun and running gun's not necessarily my favorite type of uh game either um but we we had fun playing it and you're gonna see a lot more running guns as we keep going and man this thing is right in my eyes um next up we have thexter thexter's kind of an underground game that i've heard about quite a bit in certain circles uh so i finally got to sit down and play it um some people wanted to point out in in thexter that um Depending on which version of the game you're playing, which computer system you're playing, um, some things might be fixed in the later versions. Uh, in particular, uh, the version that I played, which is one of the original versions, uh, if you were firing your gun, uh, the music would stop while that was happening and it would pick back up as soon as you stopped firing. Later versions of the game fixed that, but of course, kind of one of the main goals for me here is to try to play the original versions uh, as close as I can. So, uh, flaws and all, 
that was Thexter, uh, but there are better versions of the game out there than the one that I played. And that happens quite a bit. Uh, next up, we have Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego? Uh, this was one of my favorite games growing up. Um, I had a version that was released, I believe the version that I played was released in 1993. Um, and we'll probably briefly mention that at some point. So, like, I grew up with the game, not that particular version. So, going back to the original version was nice. I had never caught Carmen San Diego before, so actually catching her was was a lot of fun for me. And I think that it holds up pretty well. Uh, the graphics, of course, don't, but the gameplay, I think, still holds up. And, uh, you know, I don't have kids, but if I did have kids, I, I probably would have them play a modern version of Where in the World is Carmen San Diego. It's just like, here, learn geography this way. That's how I did it. Um, so, yeah, huge fan of that one. I played it for hours and hours, never understanding how to actually beat the game until, like, my cousin came over. And I'm like, wait something's different when you play it. It's like, yeah, because he knew what he was doing. Uh, next up, uh, Wishbringer. Wishbringer is another Infocom game, in case you have forgotten, because we've played quite a few of those. Uh, but uh, it was okay for an Infocom game. Um, it's still good because Infocom is, is good at what they do. But ultimately, in the scope of Infocom games, it was it was all right. It was it was it's a good. Um, I, I did like w what the game kind of evolved into. Uh, the fact that kind of it seems like you're in this alternate world, stuff like that. That was fun. Uh, but yeah, I never heard of it before we started this. Uh, next up, we have Theater Europe. Uh, Theater Europe was the first of kind of two. World, specifically Cold War strategy games, let's call it that. Uh, this was the one where we could actually try to conquer. Like, it, you, you had armies and you could actually try to march across Europe and then should bad things happen, a nuke would go off and then uh, the, the game would just end. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more, but that was, that was an interesting take. And I, I think that of the the strategy games that we've played that were still kind of based on the old system of of conquering where you just kind of have this little dot and it moves over um i think it was the, the i think it was you know an evolution in the right direction but ultimately i felt like there was you know there's just more i want more from my strategy games uh next up we have the way of the exploding fist uh, another british title I believe originally a British title. Uh, this was one that I know, once again, a lot of people really, really liked, but it just wasn't working for me. Like it, I, when it comes to a fighting game, the, the buttons have to be so specific. Like when I punch, it should feel like I'm doing some damage. It shouldn't just feel like I'm um, just hitting a button and hoping for the best. And that's how it felt with the way of the exploding fist to me. So hadn't heard of it before it made the cut because people really, really liked it. And some people were upset that I didn't, uh, but I didn't like it very much. Uh, next up we have King's quest two. Once again, I knew King's quest. I had done a version of King's quest in the past, but never King's quest two. So kind of seeing the evolution of that, it didn't evolve very much. It just felt like King's Quest, but like part two of it. Just, But uh, it was still fun. King's Quest is a great game, so I'm not surprised that it just kind of continued in that vein. Uh, next up, we have our intro to baseball. Uh, once again, huge fan of baseball. I watch baseball all the time. My team's the Angels. Uh, you can not see things there. Um, let, me, let me just show it real quick here if you're watching. Uh, three signed baseballs up there. Um, I believe one of them is from the longtime uh, Angel's second baseman. Uh, the other two, I don't know off the top of my head, uh, but I believe that I could talk about them. I think that they are uh, they they were done playing by 1985. I'm a I'm a big old um, like retro baseball fan, and we'll talk about that at some point. I have played in depth simulation games 
where I uh, basically take a team from the 1860s and move them all the way forward to today. And I have done that several times. Um, I'm, I'm a big baseball fan. I know baseball very well. So uh, that intro, uh, when it came to how to play the game, uh, I didn't look at a lot of guides for that. I just kind of winged it because I'm like, I know the game. And we'll talk about this and we'll talk about that. And we won't talk about like stats. I, I, I love baseball stats, but there was no way we were going to get into batting average and slugging percentage and on base percentage and OPS and all that kind of stuff um, in my intro video. But eventually we will have to talk about those. Um, and, and I know them very well and have strong opinions on several of them. Uh, by 1985, the one that I hate the most is not around, so I can't talk about that yet. But uh, eventually, I will. we will play a game with that stat in there, and I'll go, this is useless, and throw it out. Uh, but yeah, I, I grew up playing baseball. I'm a big baseball fan. I watch every game of my team every year. Uh, it's, it's hard, but I, I do do that. Um, so then, leading that into hardball, I had a, a version of Hardball, not the original version um, and not the original game, to be honest. But um, it's interesting to see kind of this is where it's not necessarily where baseball started in video games because we have avoided a lot of baseball video games to this point. But this is where the good, the greatest baseball games apparently start is uh, hardball. So that's why we had to talk about baseball to talk about hardball. Um, it it leaves a lot to be desired in certain aspects. Um, and that's just kind of my personal opinion, knowing where baseball games go, because I played baseball games later on. Um, I didn't like the camera angle, things like that. But it's nice to see, you know, different pitch types and um, a fairly realistic version of hitting and fielding. Um, yeah, the fielding in particular didn't work out that great. Like, there were times I hit to the gap and the guy got it and started throwing it back from the outfield when I was on first. And I'm like, I, I might be able to make it home because the, the throw was so bad. But uh, ultimately, had fun playing hardball. Nice to see how it started. We might play the version that I played at some point. Maybe not. Uh, uh, that's going to be up for debate because it comes out, I think, in the early 90s. So we'll, we'll see. Uh, next up, we have Hang On. Hang On is a game that I had heard about but never really looked into that much. Um, it's, it's hard to really replicate um, these kinds of arcade games from, I believe it's Yu Suzuki, uh, that really needs the arcade cabinet because it has more or less a version of motion controls where you lean on the motorcycle and that turns the bike in the game. Um, if you're, if I'm doing that by holding left instead of leaning left, it's not the same experience. Um, so that's one of the ones where I, I haven't seen one of the arcade titles for for hang on in particular but i have played arcade games where i did lean like that so it's nice to see the origin of that and of course that does change a lot of things so it was nice to be able to play it even if i couldn't get the full experience uh next up we have the film back to the future is that our only film this year i think it is yeah the only film that we talked about this year in depth was uh back to the future and there's a reason why. It is a legendary film. Uh, some people consider it a perfect film. I wouldn't go that far. Uh, I, I will say, I, I, I don't know if I talked about this before, but while I was doing the research for, for Back to the Future, because of course I watched it growing up, I know the film very well, but now that I'm older, I was looking for something in the development of Back to the Future that implied that the writers were fans of Doctor Who and knew Doctor Who and it never came up. Um, now knowing Doctor Who and how long Doctor Who had been around, it's easy to make the comparison between Doc and Marty and the Doctor and a companion. And then, then a lot more of the film kind of makes sense. But without that, you know, I'm 
left with questions. But really, the questions that I have are only because I've watched it so many times. I, I've uh, I've had chances to think about it. When you just watch it all the way through just once, it's a great film. But yeah, there were when you take a step back and really start kind of considering some of the aspects of the film, it's a little weird. Um, you know, not only like, Hey, what would you do if you go went back in time? Resist my mother's advances. What? <laughs> Why is that even coming up? Um, things like that are, are a little weird, but you know, in the context of the film, they make sense, but you know, you kind of take the step back and look at the production and the development and you're, I don't know, I'm left with questions at least, but that's enough of that. Like I said, great film. I love the film landmark film there's a reason that we talked about it and we will continue to talk about back to the future as we continue this project even though it's not necessarily directly uh so it, that's just kind of i didn't have another chance to really kind of talk about how like no isn't this doctor who like apparently it's not doctor who um but there's definitely I don't know. There's inspirations I feel for that film that the, the the writers didn't really discuss. Doctor Who being the main one for me. But uh, next up, we have a legendary platform game. I, I think they're still called platforms at this po point. Uh, it is Ghosts and Goblins. Now I have done Ghosts and Goblins before. I did it on this channel before I, I don't think it was a full let's play at the time i think it was just kind of a side project the game's hard um and i knew going in that people were going to want to watch me torture myself playing ghosts and goblins so that's what i did and i, I just went in knowing all right i'm going to uh use save states i'm going to basically cheat but I'm going to make it all the way through Ghosts and Goblins twice so that you can beat the game. Very difficult game. Feels unfair to me at certain points, but a lot of people say that, you know, once you get into the more difficult games and you start getting used to that, that Ghosts and Goblins isn't that hard and there are harder games out there. But when... Uh, when an enemy can basically dive bomb at you from off screen and you have to time it by jumping before he even shows up on screen, I call that unfair. Uh, but, you know, apparently I'm wrong in that one. Uh, but I'm glad that we went through it again. Uh, it's going to be a title that we will see later on, not only as inspiration, but also as a franchise and stuff like that. Uh, next up, we have Tiger Heli, which I had to remind myself of, like kind of just look at a picture and go, oh, that's right, I remember that game. Um, it, it's a shooter by Toplin and we will see many more of those. So it's nice to see them kind of start showing up and they do make high quality shooter games. Um, I'm not sure all of them are going to stand out to me as we continue to play, but that one was fun for what it was. And it, it just felt a little, if I remember right, it felt a little empty that I just kind of wanted more on screen. I, I don't know. I'm also not a big fan of the uh, the flying, taking on the ground. I just want like full on space shooters like uh, Galaga. That's that's more what I'm looking for, just in space as opposed to taking on the ground forces as well. But as a personal preference, Tiger Heli is is a great game if if you like that type of game. Next up, we have a game that I would say is not as great of a game, and that is uh, Balance of Power. Balance of Power was an interesting one because I hear a lot about it. Sorry, I keep on getting texts and I need to stop. But Balance of Power is, is a game that I felt was not designed well and not executed well. But it was legendary at the time. Uh, I think because of kind of the stance that it took and the way that you kind of had to play it was different than other strategy games that you had. If you don't remember, that was the one where you either take over as the US or the Soviet Union, and you basically try to exert your non-military um, non power by sending aid or requesting that countries do certain things. And 
anytime you made a move like that, your opponent got to challenge it. And then it became a battle of, I want to do this. I'm not going to let you do this over and over and over again until one of you bombed each other and then the game was over. Um, so I felt that that, structure of a game is a terrible structure and in order to play it properly you need a second person that going against the computer is not really going to be fun you need a second person and you basically need treaties outside of the game in order to make it fair like you could go like okay you can say absolutely no to one thing that i'm doing this time this turn and then like then you can kind of negotiate outside of the game but inside the game there just wasn't a lot for that um and so i understand why people liked it at the time but i think going back to it it was it was rough for me to go back to that one uh next up we have russian attack which is more play on words and this time still about the cold war uh russian attack was uh basically a a form of a run and gun, I guess. You kind of ran to the right and you stabbed or you shot if you had guns and stuff. Uh, once again, a, a difficult game. I don't think I made it very far in that one, uh, but a lot of people really liked it. And so I'm going to take their word for it that it that it holds up fairly well. But for me, it just wasn't it wasn't particularly interesting and, and didn't really stand out among a lot of the other games that we had. Next up is a game that absolutely stood out, and that would be Super Mario Brothers, the the big game this year. Uh, I will say that from this point forward, there's probably going to be a recognizable name every year when it comes to a video game that even casual people that don't really follow video games, they're going to know it. And Super Mario Brothers is easily the biggest one this year. Easily. Um... Landmark game, uh, a lot of people consider it uh, the birth of video games. Uh, I obviously disagree because we've been doing this for, uh, this will be year number 13, 14 from 1972 until now. You can't just discount 14 years of games because this is the first one that kind of broke through to a new level. You know what I mean? But it did reach an entirely new level that uh, no other game had to this point. It was huge huge back then and it's still fun now uh, a lot of people seem to think that mario games are easy uh this one's not um there are definitely some parts of the game that are very difficult even for experienced players once you get to like i believe world number seven it starts getting more difficult uh, and then of course there's the still you know still common at the time which is either you know how to do this or you don't and Super Mario Brothers, for for that particular aspect, it's the castles where it's just like you have to know how to navigate all the way through, and otherwise you're just stuck. Uh, but it's a great game. I've played it several times before. It might be some of my, one of the games that I played before I even could generate memories. I was probably playing that game. It's just always been there for me. So I was I was happy to talk about its development. Obviously, I, I didn't talk in depth as much as I could about the development of Super Mario Brothers, but it was nice to see um, some of the, the things that I was uh, always wanting to talk about make it into that script. So I was happy with that one. Uh, my gameplay, probably I could have been better, but you know, the game's not easy. <laughs> But I was happy to finally get through that. That's the one that probably people are going to remember the most of this year is Super Mario Brothers. But, you know, it's not, we're, we're not just doing the most recognizable games of the year. We're doing kind of everything that was important, influential, stuff like that. Uh, next up, we have Spellbreaker. Spellbreaker is another Infocom game, for those of you that have forgotten. I believe that was the... Uh, third in the Enchanter series. I believe that's how they refer to it. I've, I've been corrected several times by people that I think are getting it wrong. But either way, uh, Spellbreaker, I believe, is the third in the Enchanter, Sorcerer, then Spellbreaker line. So it's essentially uh, part number six of Zork in a way. Um, <laughs> it's not really a direct sequel, but it is... 
it's in the same world, same universe. Uh, that one was difficult. I'm not sure how anybody was going to be able to do Spellbreaker without a guide because there was so much just so many things that you had to keep track of and so many spells that you had to know. I think I think there were cubes if memory serves me right and like you ended up with several cubes all of which did something different and it was it was going to be difficult without a guide back in the day uh but they they hoped that you were experienced by that point so it was fun but you know going into it fresh probably not going to be fun for a lot of people uh next up we have the Oregon Trail so the Oregon Trail is a game that um a lot of people grew up with um, especially around my age. I actually didn't get to play it because I wasn't in public school, um, like a, a government-funded school for those of you that are not American. I wasn't in a public school until fifth grade. So fifth grade was the first time I got to play it. Uh, before then, I was on a... Uh, the computer lab was like five computers for like 200 kids. Um, so I didn't get a chance to play it until fifth grade. I thought it was amazing. I didn't even see it as an educational game at the time, uh, but then I didn't play that original version. I played uh, a much more robust version of the game that we will eventually talk about um, because the Oregon Trail, it, it's, it's permanently ingrained in a lot of people's minds, uh, especially around my age and um, probably up or down like 10 years, 10 years in age. Like uh, people are... are fond of that game because you got to play a video game at school that was huge uh so i eventually after playing a version of the oregon trail at school ended up buying a couple versions and playing it at home because i just had so much fun playing it and you know i still know a lot of kind of the midwest countryside based on the oregon trail so uh you know if you tell me chimney rock is no longer there i'll be very upset uh, but now that I actually live at the end of the Oregon Trail, I, I know how to pronounce things a little bit better, like the Willamette Valley. Uh, that's been ingrained into me. I won't get it wrong again. But um, there's lots of signs around here for the end of the Oregon Trail, which is actually at uh, Cape Dis... Well, the end of the Oregon Trail is here. I was thinking the end of Lewis and Clark, which is um, Cape Disappointment up in Washington. But yeah, Portland, Oregon, end of the Oregon Trail. Um we, you can find a lot of things on the Columbia that say, here's the end, here's the end. But it, yeah, technically it's here in Oregon, in Portland. Not entirely sure where, though, but had a lot of fun playing it. I never actually played the original version before, uh, so that was fun to actually get in and see what I could do in that one. Uh, next up, we have another intro video. This was the intro to American football. Uh, that was one that I actually got several requests to make, especially after uh, my intro to baseball video. People are like, are you going to do American football? <laughs> like, you know, I didn't want to say, of course, but, you know, I was going to be playing American football games at some point. I have to introduce how the rules work. It's a complicated game. It almost feels like war strategies when you're making an American football, like, I don't know, when you're, when you're designing an American football play, when you're designing that, like, it feels like a war strategy. It, it, it has very similar characteristics. And it feels very militarized when you're doing it. This is your role. This is what you do. If you don't do it, we die. Uh, but American football, I I didn't grow up playing. I never actually got into a, a game, a full league playing American football. But, you know, I played it a lot on the... Uh, like in on the playground and stuff like that we would play. Uh, I was always quarterback. It was what I was best at. Uh, but uh, I never really got into it because uh, I was small. <laughs> I was a small kid. And when you're small, you don't want to play a, a sport where people run at you full steam and jump into you. Uh, so I didn't actually play in a league, but I did play it. I, I grew up watching football on and off. 
I don't really have a football team. I don't really watch it these days, but I still know the game well. I just might not know the names nearly as well, especially as as much as I do baseball. But uh, American football, I do understand it. Uh, there's definitely some penalties I don't understand, but hopefully they explain those. But for the most part, you know, I think I have a good grasp on football, so I was... I was hoping that I was able to explain it well in the video, but yeah, that one, for whatever reason, I didn't get a lot of feedback on. Maybe people missed it and it just didn't go out, but I was, uh, that, that took a lot of, a lot of work to try to explain how American football works. And ultimately it's way nerdier than you think. Uh, and I think it's way nerdier than people give it credit for, but ultimately it's a game about like measurements and numbers and <laughs> all this kind of stuff. And they're like, no, 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 it's not nerdy. It's the jock. It's the most jockiest. Is that even a word? It's the most jock thing that you can do in, in American high school is play football. And it's like, yeah, but but here's a ruler for you so you can play. <laughs> um, so as, as a nerd, as a self-proclaimed nerd, uh, there are definitely a lot of aspects of American football that I fully understand. And then when it comes to the more just like, this is how you push people, that, that kind of stuff, I don't understand as well. Uh, but then we have the, uh, the, the game that, needed the introduction, which would be NFL Challenge. Now, NFL Challenge is, once again, a game that I had never heard of before, but there is, a, there is a very specific reason why we played it. Not only because it was considered revolutionary at the time, it's a hell of a simulator for 1985. That is a great game for what it is. It's not, you don't actually get to play football, but you get to call the plays and watch what happens. You're essentially the coach. And for for what it is, it, it's a great game. But there is a reason that I specifically chose this game kind of to be the first uh, football game that we did. And we'll talk about that in later years. Uh, but it, it essentially makes the mainstream. That's, that's the main thing. Video games as a whole are still not mainstream. But this game broke away from that and made the mainstream. So we'll talk about that a little bit more when we keep going. Uh, but uh, that one was a hell of a game, and I wish that I could get the original rosters, but I literally could not find the original rosters anywhere. Uh, that was a very difficult game for me to figure out how to play, but uh, I eventually found it, I think, in a browser. Like, I couldn't even get it work in any other way, and they're just, they're just like, well, we have the... I think it was 1989 roster, so I had to pretend I didn't know who San Francisco number 80 was. I absolutely know who that is. Uh, next up, we have Space Harrier. Now, Space Harrier is once again one of those games that I always wanted to play, never had the opportunity, uh, but I will say that um, while I was still scripting this one, uh, I think before I played it, yes, before I played it on this channel, I was able to find an arcade that did have Space Harrier. It was an 80s themed arcade. I'll, I'll shout it out. They're in uh, Hillsborough, Arcade 2084. Um, they, they only have games from the 80s, and I'm not going to lie, most of them are from like 1985 earlier. Uh, some of them are a little bit later, but most of them are, are, are that range. So if you're looking for, you know, Space Harrier, they, they got it, the original, and it is frantic to play that game. And I'm not very good at the, the full arcade, uh, but I was able to get a, um, you know, I was able to just put in a ton of quarters into the emulator here and be able to do it. But uh, without that, it would have cost me probably like $30 just to beat Space Harrier the first time. Uh, next up, we have Gauntlet, another game that has always been legendary that I always wanted to get into, finally got into it. Um, I wish that I was able to get four people together to sit down and play Gauntlet with me so that we could see how far I could actually go in the game, but uh, ultimately that wasn't going to happen. So I uh, hope you guys enjoyed that little part where I'm like, all right, everybody's on the same thing, let's all go, but then I can only make it so far. It's a fun game uh, to some extent, um, but it, it does feel quite repetitive, 
which it's going to because it's a gauntlet after all. So that it, it was fun to play it. Um, I wish that there were alternate things that I could do for that game now, but I only got two hands. So anyway, we'll move on to Deja Vu. Uh, Deja Vu is a weird game for me because I never fully played it. I had heard about a version of the game and I I saw that it was interesting and I wanted to kind of get into it. Uh, so playing the original version, which is honestly a much better version than the version I was looking at, it was good. It was the first in a series. We'll, we'll probably continue the series. I believe we continue the series. Uh, but, you know, playing this kind of film noir detective character, this grizzled guy that you just picture with, you know, permanent five o'clock shadow and, you know, a cigarette going and saying that a, a dame walked into his office with legs up to there. It's 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 fun. Uh, there were definitely parts of the game that um, didn't age so well, but you know it's a it's definitely a fun game. I like solving mysteries. I like story, and the game had a lot of that that a lot of other games don't have. Like what's the story of Gauntlet or Space Harrier? But Deja Vu had a story, so I was I was a big fan of that. Next up, we have a couple consoles. Uh, first, the NES. Uh, obviously, this is just the Nintendo Entertainment System that was released in North America. Every region kind of has its own slightly different version of the NES, but we're talking about the, the North American release. It's still not fully released. Keep that in mind. It is still just kind of in beta testing, so to speak. Uh, it's being released in small markets, not really even across America, just in a couple well, they're not small markets. One of them is New York. It's the biggest market. But they're being released in, in limited markets. So it's still not fully released at the end of 1985. But you have to know it's coming, right? Like, it's successful everywhere they release it. It's, it's doing great over in Japan. It's only a matter of time. And we will continue tracking that, even if it's not in its own video. And we'll talk more about how we deal with the NES later. Um, I will say that I did have an NES growing up. Uh, I won't say how I got it, because <laughs> I didn't live in New York. But uh, I did have one growing up, uh, and I had several games for it. And I ended up uh, selling it so that I could get uh, a different thing. Uh, but, yeah, uh, I think... I think back in the day we sold it for like $100 at a garage sale because it was the only way I could talk my parents into getting me something that I wanted more. That's all I'll say about that at the time because uh, so, like clearly spoilers for like the early 90s. Uh, but then the other console that we talked about is the Sega Mark III. And I still have to call it the Sega Mark III. It's not the name that you know it by probably. Uh, the Sega Mark III, I never had it. Uh, I didn't even hear about that console until I was probably a teenager. I didn't know anybody that had it. Uh, so uh, any game that we play on the Sega Mark III, chances are it'll be the first time that I've played it. Uh, so it'll be it'll be interesting because it, it felt like a it feels like a different world sometimes in the in the, the scheme of video games that. Sometimes uh, a lot of kids grew up with the NES and then some kids grew up with the Sega Mark III and they had a completely different set of games. So we'll, we'll have fun exploring that one, I think. Next up, speaking of games that I never played, Monty on the Run. Uh, Monty on the Run is an interesting game. Uh, the, as uh, some people said at the time, like the, the song, because it's just one song. It's just like a six minute song on, re on repeat. It's amazing for 1985. It is the best video game song that we have probably heard. The only other exception I think could be made for uh, Super Mario Brothers. But from a technical standpoint, I would say Money on the Run has better music. It's just that the, the Super Mario Brothers had catchier music. And of course, it is iconic music. But Money on the Run might be a better song in and of itself. Uh, just didn't have the impact. Um, I had never heard of Monty on the Run or really the Monty Mole series. 
Uh, I had heard of a Monty Mole, but it's a different Monty Mole. And I'll have to look into that one more to see what's going on there. Uh, but I hadn't heard of this one. The reason that it made the list is because it has been considered one of the best platform games of all time. I disagree with that. I I think that the I think that there were better uh, versions of even British platform games by that point. Uh, but a lot of people really liked Monty on the Run, so I, I gave it a shot. It bugged out on me. Um, I think between the time that I recorded it and I uploaded it, they released a, a remastered version. Um, <laughs> that probably would have fixed the problem and not let it bug out on me, but um, I didn't know about it at the time because I didn't think it got released. Uh, so um, apparently if you want to play that version, hopefully it doesn't break on you. But yeah, I didn't know about it when I recorded that. Uh, so there you go. Money on the run. Yeah, it's there. Uh, and it's another British platform game. It, it just, I don't know why that one was singled out as like one of the best of all time. I, I just don't know. Uh, next up, another game that I never, I didn't grow up playing. Are there any more? Yeah, maybe not. Um, but uh, Xanadu is next. Um, that is... Uh, the action RPG, uh, only ever released in Japan. Even to this day, Xanadu is only ever released in Japan. Uh, it has gained a cult following outside of Japan uh, because it is part of the Dragon Slayer series, which will continue and will grow. Uh, but for me, going into Xanadu, I had... I don't want to say I had expectations. I didn't have a ton of expectations. But as I kept going, it just got more frustrating. So this was the first game that I abandoned as an RPG. Just, I can't do it. We're done here. Uh, because Xanadu didn't give me the opportunity to fix any mistakes. And it didn't give me the opportunity to kind of make up for difficult times by making it easier on me. It, it just was what it was. Um, and so it, it was difficult in a new way that I wasn't prepared to handle. So, uh, I, and I, as I kept going, I just got more and more frustrated. But with that said, those are kind of the negative aspects of it. The game is hugely influential. Having not heard of this game before, before this series, um, I didn't expect much in terms of seeing the influence of the game, but having played it now, there's a game coming up in 1986. I don't want to spoil too much of 1986, and we're, we're going for so long here. I don't want to spoil too much about 1986, but there is a game that doesn't cite Xanadu as uh, an inspiration that I feel absolutely has to say... We were inspired by Xanadu, like, and it's it's a legendary game. <clears throat> so, I feel that Xanadu does deserve to be talked about in more details. It was very popular in uh, Japan at the time. They say the most popular computer RPG, uh, but that's because there's a dispute about Hydlide's numbers. Because Hydlide was supposed to be the number one, and now Xanadu says it's number one. And the company behind Xanadu, Neon Falcom, is just like, well, you're lying, so we're right. <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, I don't know anything about sales numbers in Japan in 1985. Uh, but it was hugely popular there, and, I mean, it's going to be obvious to see the influence moving forward. So definitely worth talking about. And I was glad I was able to talk about it for as long as I was, uh, but... Yeah, there is a part of me that's like, well, oh, maybe I could go back and finish it, but I just got so frustrated by the end. Next up, we have Ninja Jaja Maru Kun. Uh, <laughs> going to be the first of many games that are going to be hard for me to pronounce. Um, Ninja Jaja Maru Kun, uh, once again, very popular in Japan, never really released outside of Japan. I don't think that one might have a virtual console release which is a term I shouldn't be using. It might have a, a later version release at some point uh, that was released in North America, but at least at the time, it's it's just a Japanese title, I believe. Um, interesting, very Japanese, like folk, traditional type stories, uh, but ultimately um, was very repetitive, so uh, it didn't last long for me. Uh, next up, we have International Karate. 
International Karate is another basically fighting game. It's kind of it's it's kind of a sports game slash fighting game because the sport is fighting. Uh, but International Karate was another one that it it's hard for me to single out looking back at it because it just kind of feels like another version of games that we have been playing for a while. But it was very popular over in Europe, so and they loved it. Same with like Way of the Exploding Fist, they loved it. So we talked about it. Uh, it just didn't. It doesn't stand out to me in comparison to a lot of the other games that we have seen, especially in other regions, particularly, you know, well, the two other regions, Japan and the United States. Uh, next up, we have our introduction to soccer. Soccer is an interesting one. I. I didn't grow up playing soccer. Uh, I didn't really fully understand soccer. I think I played it on the playground a few times, and I would always end up being the goalie because I was good with my hands and not necessarily my feet. Uh, so uh, I understand soccer. It's it's. I mean, there's as you saw in the introduction, there's not a lot to talk about when it comes to understanding soccer. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, the, you just kind of have to figure out, okay, what constitutes a foul? And the answer is whatever the referee decides constitutes a foul. That's what a foul is. Um, and then you start figuring out what some of the, the results of those are. Uh, but ultimately, soccer, I didn't grow up playing, but I, I understand. Uh, I I'm not really a huge fan of soccer. There's a lot of people that will follow, especially European teams, and they'll follow the, the countries. I don't really do that, but um, I do like it. Like, if it's on, it's not like I'm going to be upset, but, you know, I don't seek out soccer. Um, and even, once again, even me calling it soccer is controversial, like I said in that video, because a lot of people here kind of get... Um, a little snooty and just go, no, it's football. And I'm like, yeah, not in America. Uh, in Japan, it's also called soccer, by the way. So when we play Japanese soccer games, like this next one, they also call it soccer. And the next one is Tekon World Cup, which is our first soccer game. And that one was a lot of fun. I like that one. It was a little easy because you can start figuring out where, like, certain spots, uh, because you can only fire in eight directions. Um, you can figure out certain spots where you would just automatically get a goal. Um, but, you know, for, for a 1985 sports game, that's going to happen. There's just certain things that certain spots and certain techniques that the, the computer just can't handle. Uh, it was just really easy for me to find it this time. But ultimately, it's a fun game. It would have been more fun against a, a human uh, as opposed to a computer where I could just keep doing the same thing over and over and win. Uh, but still a good game. Next up, we have Ultima 4, Quest of the Avatar. Once again, a legendary game that I always wanted to play and finally got the chance to do it thanks to the series. So I was happy to do it. Very different game than what I'm used to when it comes to RPGs. Um, there is grinding in the game, but I wouldn't say it's level grinding, because it's not level grinding. It's grinding for virtue and grinding for um, experience that doesn't increase your level. It's, it's an interesting game. Um, I can see why it was considered revolutionary at the time, which is my word, but, you know, it was very important and seen as a, a groundbreaking game. Uh, but playing it now, it it's hard to... I, I think it would be hard to get people super interested in it. I think it would be easier to get people interested in fighting as opposed to, you know, uh, giving blood <laughs> over and over and over again. Why? Because that's how you level up. Um... It's an interesting game. I'm glad we did it, um, but I, I wanted more story, and I, I don't know. It was good, though. It was really good. Um, it, I, it might be the best RPG that we've played to this point. I think I mentioned that at the time, and I, I think it holds up. I'm trying to think of all the different RPGs that we have played. I, I think it is. Spoilers for rewards later in this, but yeah, the, very good game. Just like a lot of other RPGs, just doesn't hold up well for one reason or another. Uh, next up, we have Microsoft Windows, the first Windows. Uh, that's going to be important enough that we're going to track that pretty pretty closely. Um, 
I, I did have Windows growing up. I didn't have the original Windows, though. We'll talk about the Windows that I had eventually. Um, but the, um, the OS, the operating system, is going to be vital to how a lot of people experience video games. So this is something that we are going to be tracking. Um, because as you saw when we played uh, Reversi in Windows, like it comes with games. So those games that, that Windows comes with are going to be incredibly popular with zero sales numbers, right? Nobody bought Microsoft Reversi but a lot of people were playing Microsoft Reversi because it came with Windows. So we're gonna see a lot of things like that as we continue. Uh, next up, we have Romance of the Three Kingdoms. This was an interesting one. Um, I, of course, had heard of Romance of the Three Kingdoms as a, as a video game before, we, uh, before I played this and did this project, but um, I had, I'd never gotten a chance to play it. Didn't really know what I was getting into when I got into this game. Um, it ended up being a lot slower than I thought, uh, but it was a strategy game much more, much more in line with what I'm used to when it comes to a conquering strategy game. Uh, and the only thing that I can kind of compare it to right now is Risk, because Risk ex existed before this game. But if you have been playing strategy games since 1985, a lot of this kind of stuff will seem very familiar. So I was happy to see that. Um, there were a lot of things I didn't understand about basically Chinese culture when it came to that game. I still don't fully understand it, but um, there, there were definitely parts of the culture that went into the game that didn't quite make sense to me. You know, like, you know, Lu Bei can just write a letter and somebody will switch allegiance. And they're like, yeah, of course. And I'm like, that's weird. No, that's weird. Um, but I am told that that's how it was at the time. And it's because they wanted China as a whole to do well, not just necessarily their small little kingdom. And they saw themselves as Chinese and not part of, you know, Lu Bei's kingdom or whatever. Um, there were definitely aspects of the game that I didn't fully understand, but that kind of goes without saying for any strategy game at this point because they don't fully explain everything. Uh, I will say though that um, I I had I did pronounce it cow cow during that, and a couple people did try to correct me, and they want me to say tsao tsao, like T S A O T S A O tsao tsao. Um, I have heard it that way as well, but the way that I have heard it more is cow cow. Um, I guess there are two different translation systems <laughs> and one does it this way and one does it that way i don't know i'm no expert i'm just telling you what i've heard right that's all i can really say uh but ultimately romance three kingdoms best strategy game that we've played to this point things are getting better right best rpg best strategy game things are getting better uh but from a modern perspective it's slow and it takes too long kind of the overall thing all right, next up we have The Bard's Tale, the last one that we did. Uh, the Bard's Tale, uh, always wanted to play it, never got around to it. And now that I've done it, I'm glad that I've done it and I'll probably never do it again. Uh, there was just too much grinding in the game. as If you saw that, you know um, at least some of it, but you probably didn't add up that I would have needed to grind somewhere in the range of 50 to 100 hours just to beat this game, just grinding for a maybe 10 hour game. It's just too much. And as a result, that doesn't, that's not going to hold up well. And this is coming from somebody that before I started this was known to have no problem level grinding. That's what like people would just come back and go, how much? Why did you do this? Why did you grind that much? And I'm still looking at this game going, there's no way I'm going to grind that much. So it's a lot of level grinding, probably too much. Um, all right, so those are the topics that we had. A lot of it was backloaded. We spent a lot of time in Ultima 4, Romance of the Three Kingdoms, and The Bard's Tale. Uh, but that was the year. Uh, so let's talk about things that I almost turned into videos. At some point or another, these were... God, I should turn on a light. It's really dark in here. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll be fine. Um, the 
the, at one point or another, these were scheduled to be videos, and then they became honorable mentions instead, um, for one reason or another. Usually, it just wasn't as popular as I thought, or not as influential as I thought, or one reason or another just got dropped down. There's a lot of them. There's The Pawn, Starquake, Doctor Who and the Minds of Terror. I do want to say, like, I really want to play a Doctor Who game. I don't think we're going to. I, I don't think any of them are going to be good enough. Somebody make a good Doctor Who game. Uh, next up, Lord of the Rings Game 1. Once again, I want to do Lord of the Rings. Somebody make a good Lord of the Rings game. I, I, Lord of the Rings, though, I know somebody will at some point. Doctor Who, though, I don't think at some point we will. I don't know. As far as I can tell, we're not for a while. Lord of the Rings just takes a while. Uh, next up, uh, Red Moon, Nightshade, Tau Ceti, A Mind Forever Voyaging, Silent Service. Uh, I almost did a, vi a video on the Amiga 1000 when it was released, but just kind of like, uh, there's so many versions. Uh, next up, we have Winter Games. Rescue on Fractalus, Swords and Sorcery, Star Luster, Coronis Rift, and Mobius, the Orb of Celestial Harmony. A lot of those games sounded really interesting, but then as soon as I kind of looked into it, it wasn't nearly as interesting as I thought. Uh, but yeah, those are, those are the ones. All right, moving on. How, we're over an hour in. All right. <laughs> These are always so long. All right, hopefully I remembered to cut that out because I'm on a new system here. But things I learned this year, there were quite a few. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is Laserdisc games. So I already knew that Laserdisc games were, were, they were kind of already on the way out, but I had never heard of RDI video systems really, and they effectively killed Laserdisc, Laserdisc games in 1985. They tried to make that home console for it, and it was so expensive that nobody bought it, and they didn't even fully release it. But because they tried to do that, I personally think nobody was really trying to make Laserdisc games after that. Uh, we haven't really done too much on Laserdisc games, mostly just like uh, Dragon's Lair and those kinds of things, but a lot of people were making Laserdisc games, and then they just stopped. They're like, it's too expensive, nobody's buying it, the, the systems break all the time, but RDI video systems, they pretty much killed it. That was pretty much it. Uh, next up, Atari. Atari is complicated. The corporations just continue to be complicated. There's just, like, there's three, I think, going right now, and... All of them have Atari in it at some point, like, uh, but yeah, it's it's just complicated. They're still a huge name, but people are really not not sold on it. They're interested in the Atari name, but uh, I, my notes here they're soured on the name as well. Um, it's not going to saying that you're you have like a new console or a new Atari console or a new Atari computer, people aren't going to buy it just because it says Atari anymore, but they're interested in what you're doing. That It's kind of a weird dichotomy, but like people are interested because it's still kind of a big name in America. Atari might still be the biggest name in video games at the end of 1985, but the, if they release anything, you're not going to... The, the, nobody's going to go buy it because they released it, if that makes sense. Uh, next up, we have politics. Uh, I, I try not to talk about politics too much, um, because politics can be very controversial. But politics, they're definitely starting to enter into video games in a f pretty obvious way, right? Uh, particularly the Cold War games that we have played. Uh, the Cold War is really picking up in history, and video games are reflecting that. So they, we, we haven't seen the Cold War kind of be front and center in video games for a while, really ever, but they're really starting to be there. Like Missile Command, you can make an argument, but this time it's like, yes, US versus USSR. Like that, that's what's going on. Uh, but the biggest takeaway from this that I can see is that people really do want to push for peace 
and they do not want a nuclear holocaust. That's the biggest takeaway that I have from games like Balance of Power and Theater Europe, and even a Mind Forever Voyaging to some extent, even though we didn't talk that much about it. It's like people want peace. They want the Cold War to end, and they don't want it to end with a nuclear holocaust. Nuclear holocaust. That's what we're talking about. Next up, we have open world. Um, I also call them sandbox games. Um, the idea is that you can kind of go wherever you want and do several different things. Um, they are appearing. Mercenary is a great example of them, um, of that. But they typically need work. And Mercenary is also a great example of that. Just, sure, you can go anywhere. Do you have anything over there? And like, no, it's empty. Then why can I go over there? <laughs> Um, next up, we have morality. Uh, kind of tied into the politics, morality is really starting to take a larger role in video games. Um, Ultima 4 and Hydlide 2 had actual morality systems built into the game so that you can focus on nonviolent solutions and that would make your character stronger. And then there's other things where ethics are still prominent but they're not necessarily ingrained in the game and balance of power is a great example of that where you have some ethical responsibility that will weigh on the game but that's not the point of the game uh next up as i kind of mentioned before this year was very backloaded uh we had way more topics in the second half than we did in the first half and the games at the end were longer. Um, expect that to continue. Uh, there's there's going to be more in the holiday season, the traditional holiday season, the fourth quarter of the year, uh, than there are at the beginning of the year. And that that's going to continue probably from this point forward. Uh, but the amount of games at the end of this year kind of makes it seem like everything is kind of turning around for the video game industry. Things are starting to look up. Uh, so things might finally be on the rebound, but the numbers are still very low and the rebound's going to take a time, going to take a long time to go through that. The, the video game crash of 1983 took a long time to kind of have its big downfall. The recovery is also going to take a substantial amount of time. We will do at some point some sort of retrospective video on the video game crash of 1983 when I feel like it's over. And although some people say it's over in 1985, I disagree. We're going to push it a little bit further. Uh, next up, uh, specifically about Mario, what I was surprised to hear is that the names in Super Mario Brothers, by the time the original Super Mario Brothers is released, there are already name differences and translation differences. In Japan, Bowser is just known as King Koopa. He is known as that in America, but he's also known as Bowser. Princess Toadstool is known as Princess Peach in Japan at the time. Personally, I like Pr Princess Peach better. It's just a better name. But Princess Toadstool is probably better because that's a mushroom. And she's in charge of the, the Mushroom Kingdom and all these toads that are mushrooms. Um, well, we'll be keeping an eye on the differences as we continue. But I was just surprised that it showed up at in 1985. Uh, one more thing that I learned. I learned this from comments. No, oh, my dog is getting very needy. Um, people at the time, people in 1985, they're loyal to their computer systems in a way that I didn't anticipate. Um, whenever I get a comment for a particular game and said, I played this game and it's a computer game, almost every time I'm told which computer system it was on, and also, that is the system I should have played it on. You know, oh, I played this uh, 1984 game on this 1988 computer, and you should have done that because that's a better version. 
Um, I'm, I'm getting quite a few of those comments. Once again, I stick to the originals as best as I can. I also have to keep in mind what's easy for me to record and to be able to play and stuff like that. Um, but you know, the, the game, four years is a long time in video games at this point. So if it's, you know, four years later, I'm sure they made a lot of improvements, but that doesn't mean that's what we're going to look at. Um, but it was surprising to see how many people were very particular of, like, I played it on this system. But, you know, I, I just didn't expect it. All right, things to keep in mind. Once again, I have a list here. We're going away. We're, we're going all the way here. Um, things to keep in mind: game difficulty is still very high. Uh, look at games like Ghosts and Goblins, or Space Harrier, or The Bard's Tale. Uh, those are difficult games. Um, this is typically done on purpose, uh, either to eat quarters, like Ghosts and Goblins and Space Harrier, <laughs> like Space Harrier. If you don't know what you're doing, you you can go through what twenty dollars an hour easily, easily, probably twenty dollars every ten minutes sometimes. Um, so it's either designed to eat the quarters or to artificially lengthen home games, right? Like I said, the Bard's Tale, if you want to just go through it and you're already kind of max level, like five ten hours and you're all the way through it, but you need to do the level grinding, suddenly you're looking at like 100 hours. And people want that. People want a longer game. They want to make it feel like it was worth their money. And one way to do that is to make the game sometimes just too long. Um, as I mentioned in the last video, Commodore is still dominating the American computer market, but in my mind, they clearly think the lifespan of the Commodore 64 is almost over. They've released two replacements for the computer. They they have the Commodore 6 uh sorry, Commodore 128 and the Amiga 1000. These are both designed to replace the Commodore 64. But the Commodore 64 is still the best-selling computer in the American market. So keep an eye on that. They that might change, and maybe they'll actually get what they want on the new systems. But maybe people are just stuck on the sixty-four. Uh, all right. Next up, um, we have. Yeah, sorry, my dog is just so needy. All right, back in. Um, next up, we'll talk about the versus system. Um, many games might have started as arcade games technically on the versus system but most people consider them either famicom or nes games uh keep in mind that the versus system essentially is a famicom in an arcade cabinet so uh they're essentially the same game uh but i will always try to focus on whichever got released first so if something got released on the versus system first and then it's on the Famicom maybe even a couple months later. I'm going to be doing the arcade version and then the Famicom version I'm going to consider a port. But for a lot of people, they're considered Famicom originals and I can see why that would be the case. Speaking of the Famicom, uh, the Famicom is really the first console that seems to be focusing on exclusive games, barring the, the Versus system stuff. They... They have games that cannot be ported to other consoles because of their contract, but they have a lot of games that are made exclusively for the Famicom. Look at Super Mario Brothers, which is arguably the best game on the system at this point. Um, the Atari 2600, ColecoVision, Intellivision, and all the other consoles that we have talked about, they primarily focused on porting arcade games, right? They all had like versions of Space Invaders, for instance. But the Famicom, those games are designed specifically for the Famicom or the Versus system, right? That is their goal, is to have a different experience than basically a lesser version of going to the arcade. And we're going to keep an eye on that because that's an interesting new strategy for a home console and one that I personally think will work out well, but, you know, what do I know? Uh, next up, 
we are still seeing bankruptcies in 1985. That's kind of why I didn't want to say um, that 1985 is the turning point. Now, the, the video game crash is over, right? It, it's not. We're still seeing companies go bankrupt. We're still seeing a lot of negative publicity about video games. And we're seeing low numbers of sales and things like that. Um, just like the, the downfall from 1983, it's going to take a while to come back up. But things are starting to look positive, right? We're starting to see a turn. It's just going to take a while. So we'll, we'll come back to that at some point. Uh, next up, um, war games, simulations. And by simulations, I really mean like flight simulators. Like, hey, this is, you can fly an F1 or whatever. And British computer games. There, there are so many of those games, and they're often in their, a completely separate market. Um, what I'm attempting to do is show off the standouts of those types of games, um, it's stuff that kind of pushes it or is considered especially good, uh, because especially the British computer games, the reviews are so difficult for me to go through. I recently found what was considered the worst uh, ZX Spectrum game of all time, and um, two magazines still gave it over a 60%. <laughs> like, it's just so skewed. Uh, but my my attempt is to show off all the standouts and everything that pushes, uh, but even the list of games that I talk about, even the honorable mentions, I'm barely scratching the surface of how many th there are. There are so many of those games. Um and they all seem very similar from the outside, which is why I'm not going deep into them. Uh, but there is information out there if you're looking for it. Uh, next up, games of this time often have secrets that you have to know just to beat the game. Um, some, of, some of these games will offer small clues. Uh, most of the games, however, do not. There's nothing in the manual. There's nothing inside the game itself. You just have to know to do this very specific thing. Otherwise, you're not going to beat the game. That is something to keep in mind because I'm sometimes making it look easy by knowing that thing, right? Um, and this has been around since more or less the beginning. Look at like Colossal Cave Adventure where do you, you know, fight the dragon with what? Your fists? Yes. That was it. Um, then, but keep in mind that for some people, these are hard stops. This is an obstacle that they would never be able to overcome because they don't know the secret. Uh, once again, this is kind of geared towards artificially lengthening games, right? You want to make sure that people spend a lot of time on your game if they're dropping $50. So how do you do it? Well, you just don't tell them how to beat it. <laughs> that happens sometimes. And then the final thing that you to keep in mind is we are not talking about high scores anymore, if you noticed. Um, they're, they're becoming less and less important. Scores aren't really what people are looking for anymore. After the video game crash of 1983 in particular, I would say, the emphasis in video games is more on completing the game than getting a high score. There are still games out there where you're trying to get the high score, don't get me wrong. Uh, Super Mario Brothers has a tally for the high score, but if you ask somebody what their highest score in Super Mario Brothers is, most people are going to tell you they have no idea. They don't look at that. They're, they're trying to get through levels. They can tell you what level they got to. They can tell you, uh, what, you know, what things they have done in the game, but the score? Not really that important. So we're not talking about it nearly as much as, as we did before. And that's the reason why it's just not as big of a deal. All right, so those are the things that I learned. Time to move on to our next little segment. It's time to talk about Patreon. All right, so I want to give a, a thank you. Really, I do mean it. To all the patrons that I have. Uh, Squirrel Dash, Daniel. I get it wrong every time. Uh, Gibbous. Jib Jibis. Jibis wearing brony. Uh, Isa. Isa Ioi. Uh, Joe B. Mike Lindgren. The Smash Project 101. 
Veronica Gross, Marcus N., and Sean Armstrong. And like I do for all these videos, I reached out to the patrons. Do, do you guys have anything to contribute? Got a few responses. Let's go through them. Uh, first up, we have uh, the Smash Project 101. Uh, goes by Strawberry System as well. Uh, honestly, this year is oftentimes considered the Anno Domini of video games, with the three games I will mention, Tetris, Super Mario Bros., and Ultima 4. I would also note that, judging by the blockbuster movies of the year on both sides of the Cold War, notably Rocky IV, Rambo II, and Come and See, it seemed to be a peak year for the Cold War. Thank goodness we avoided catastrophe. For now, funny you should mention that, I've already recorded the cultural world of 1986. It does not start well. Uh, but yes, some people uh, consider uh, year one of video games to be 1985, Anno Domini, 80, year one. Um, I obviously don't. Tetris maybe came out in 1984, maybe 1985. Uh, right, Alexei seems to be changing his mind. Uh, but... Um, this is kind of considered the first year, and yeah, the Cold War is taking center stage for a lot of this stuff. Maybe something will happen in 1986 to change that? Maybe not. All right, uh, let's go with Gibbous wearing brownie. I'm not quite caught up yet, still watching through Ultima 4. There's a lot of it. Uh, but aside from the obvious two things stand out for me this year. Money on the Run set a new high watermark for video game music, not to discredit Mario and Tetris. And we're already seeing the fruits of Rogue's influence with Carmen Sandiego and the Oregon Trail, both using procedural generation. Interesting, yes. Also, the fact that Back to the Future's entire cast reads as stereotypes marks either its influence or the quality of its writing, but I can't tell which. So yeah, uh, the music for Money on the Run. Yeah, that song was really good. Uh, especially for a computer at the time. And then, yes, Rogue is influencing things. There's a lot of games with procedural generation going, and they're starting to hit much more of the mainstream. We already saw it a bit with, uh, uh, I think it was Wolfenstein. Um, we are starting to see kind of random procedurally generated stuff going on, and they're, they're sticking with that, especially in, I don't want to say budget titles, but... Uh, titles that have um, less programming ability, right? So Carmen Sandiego and the Oregon Trail, where it's just like, well, here's these random events that can happen. And yeah, Back to the Future, it's very influential. <laughs> All right, it's from Issa. We have, in the interest of keeping it short, since it was a big year, I'm just going to touch on uh, what I had direct experience with. I did play Xanadu to completion, undeniably a very convoluted, clunky, and obscure game. I wouldn't be surprised if the completion rate was very low. It's not even close to being my favorite Dragon Slayer title, but I recognize the place it had in its time. Super Mario Brothers, I don't think I could say anything that hasn't already been said by someone about how important it is and everything else too. King's Quest 2 played it. It's King's Quest 1 again. Some progress, but still not much to add here. I didn't personally play Ultima 4 or Romance of the Three Kingdoms, but I had seen them before. I just don't think I have it in me to play them. I'm interested in those series in the future, though. In particular, Ultima 4 is a great idea, but the gameplay really makes it too heavy for me to enjoy. I did play Bard's Tale while not cheating in the same way. I did cheat by picking a version with a lot of improvements. I wanted to try one of the old school wizardry like without having to deal with some of the things I have no patience for, like manually mapping. I still ended up needing a lot of guidance. So all in all, what do I think? This year saw a lot of minor improvements that are going to snowball into huge things with time, but it's still limited by the game developers copying from each other what at the time were considered good mechanics and technological boundaries. The Nintendo games are taking a step in what I consider the right direction, making intuitive designs with decent controls and responsiveness, but it's still early. Of course, they are not the only ones experimenting with new ideas, but they are the driving force of inspiration for now. Game of the year? I mean, it's got to be Mario, objectively. Yeah, lots of stuff, lots of good points there. I don't have too much to add to this one, actually, but yeah, Bard's Tale and Ultima 4 and Romance of the Three Kingdoms, they require lots of patience, so finding other versions or 
even in some cases, later titles might be the way to go for most people when it comes to that. And yes, Nintendo is pushing. They're doing things differently, which is nice to see. And then from Demi, uh, 1985 is an incredibly big and an important year in video game history and one that most gamers have some sort of knowledge on for one reason or another. Between Super Mario Brothers, Ghosts and Goblins, Xanadu, and the ever-important beginning of the NES sales, this year is when video games begin to really take shape and become parts of people's lives, especially when considering the home console market. To me, this is also when more genres of games begin to settle in and take on more solid and unique design choices. Super Mario Bros. needs no introduction and it stands the test of time as a very fun and easily replayable platformer. And Romance of the Three Kingdoms, while perhaps somewhat tedious after some time, still introduces a unique strategy gameplay style that sets it apart quite nicely. The Bard's Tale is a nice spin on RPGs of the time that has some cool and interesting mechanics to call its own, and the Oregon Trail also deserves a mention for the diversity in its scenarios and its different definition of difficulty. Ultima 4 is a nice continuation and evolution of the series, though I'd say we're a, still a bit off from when it becomes the series I love to play. And King's Quest 2 is a good continuation to an already lovable series. I can't deny the Nihon Falcom bias I have, and I really want to give Xanadu my Game of the Year award, as I really love the unique take it has on both uh, combat and exploration for an RPG, and I believe it is a great concept as well as a great step up from Dragon Slayer. However, I can't deny that it is quite messy and fails to give a lot of necessary feedback the player would need to understand its mechanics. For that reason, I have to say Super Mario Bros. takes the cake this year. Despite me not being that much of a platformer fan, it's too much of a classic and timeless game to say no to, and personal tastes aside, it's a lot of fun to play even though uh, play through even to this day. That isn't to say there aren't other releases I loved, though. The aforementioned King's Quest II is a game I very much enjoyed with its quirky and comedic writing, and The Bard's Tale is a great and unique RPG. I was also surprised by Deja Vu, which I found to be a very interesting release. Overall, a very solid year with many enjoyable releases, and with which the way is paved for many more and even better years to come. Looking forward to more games and, of course, more videos. Keep up the great work, as always. Yeah, uh, Xanadu, like I said uh, before, but you, you did uh, probably a better job of it. It's, it's a great concept. It pushes things in the right direction. I just struggle with its, with its implementation of those. Um, but yeah, it, I, I understand why, why it's beloved by certain people. Uh, solid year. Happy to, to keep going. Hopefully we can make it go a little faster. We'll talk about that more later. And then uh, finally, we have Joe B, who says, Thank you for struggling through Ghosts and Goblins and Xanadu. It's interesting to see how intricate strategy games have become in 1985. This year, Super Mario Brothers took gaming to new heights. I'm looking forward to next year where platformers really take over the landscape and where even more RPG staples are born. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Um, so those are the Patreon uh, the patrons and their thoughts. If you guys want to join them and get uh, mentioned in all of this, uh, Patreon links are in the descriptions of all the videos. Uh, but for now, it's time to look at awards. My dog still needs attention. Uh, so we'll start with kind of non-video game stuff. Uh, the first one is the favorite film of the year. This one is a no-brainer for me. It's Back to the Future easily my favorite film of 1985. Uh, some honorable mentions, though, are Rocky IV, Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, Clue, I actually like Clue, and Brazil, which is something you sometimes hear, sometimes you don't. Uh, favorite TV show? This one was, this one's always hard for me. Uh, nothing really stands out to me as my favorite TV show, so I gave it to something that I liked as a kid, and that's Muppet Babies. I liked Muppet Babies still good. It holds up fairly well. I mean, it's still a kid's show, but yeah. Honorable mentions, Adventures of the Gummy Bears, another kid's show. Uh, MacGyver, I, I do like MacGyver. And Golden Girls, which is probably an overlooked sitcom at the time, but I, I did enjoy it. Uh, next up, favorite console. This one's also kind of a no-brainer for me. It's the Famicom. 
Uh, everything else is either basically discontinued or doesn't have any original games. The Famicom. Like, Super Mario Brothers alone makes it the, the, my favorite console of the year. Like, easily. Uh, next up, we have the most disappointing game. I don't want to say the worst game because we don't play the worst games. We only play good games. But the most disappointing game for me is Balance of Power. And Balance of Power is... It, it, it was disappointing because... Like, it was designed to be a frustrating game. I don't, I don't see how else you could play it other than, than to be frustrated immediately. Uh, other honorable mentions for most disappointing, The Way of the Exploding Fist, International Karate. Uh, just not my favorites. And they struggle with basic controls. It just never felt right playing the game for me. A uh, game that aged the worst, uh, it feels bad saying it, but for me it was uh, Xanadu. And a lot of that has to do with it being very influential and people taking the concepts in Xanadu and improving upon them. And so going back to it feels bad. So that's why for me it aged the worst. It was really good at the time, I think, but as time went on, there were other improvements that didn't work for it. Um, honorable mentions for Age the Worst, Balance of Power again, uh, Money on the Run, I, I just don't understand why people love that one so much, but that's just me. Once again, my opinion, you feel free to play it for yourself and tell me I'm wrong. Uh, then we have Ninja Jaja Maru-kun, because it was, mm, basic. Uh, all right, let's go on to good stuff then. Uh, favorite shooter of the year? That's got, we're gonna do, actually, uh, we're going to do uh, genres for the first time because there's actually genres and it feels like completed genres. So let's go for it. We'll start with my favorite shooter of the year. Uh, that's going to be Gradius. Gradius was my favorite. It's how we started and I don't think anything beat it. Some honorable mentions though. Commando. Commando is good. Uh, and then Space Harrier was also very good. But Gradius for me took it. Uh, favorite action game slash racing game because they're kind of the same. Um, sometimes. <laughs> uh, for me, it's Hang On. Hang On was my favorite of the year. Um, some honorable mentions, though. Paperboy was was fun. Paradroid was fun to some extent as well. Favorite platform game? Easy. Super Mario Brothers. There's, there was no doubt on this one, was there? Uh, honorable mention, though. Ghosts and Goblins. Ghosts and Goblins was a good platform game this year. Uh, favorite adventure game. This is where my bias really starts stepping up. For me, personally, and I know I'm biased on it, it's where in the world is Carmen Sandiego. I love it. I, I love Carmen Sandiego. Um, but uh, some honorable mentions. Wishbringer was fun. Uh, Mercenaries for its potential, it wasn't it wasn't an overall great game, but it had a lot of potential, so I got to give it to to that one for that. Uh, King's Quest Two, Oregon Trail, Deja Vu, those were all great games, but because I'm not gonna lie, it's because I grew up with Where in the World Is Carmen San Diego, I still love it. Um, next up, favorite RPG, I already spoiled it. It's Ultima Four. Um, it, it has a lot of flaws still, don't get me wrong, but for me. It was, it was definitely the best that we did this year, and probably to this point. Honorable mentions, Xanadu for its potential, right? It, it had the potential. It was almost there. We just needed some, some fixes, and it would have been so much better. Uh, and then the Bard's Tale, but Bard's Tale also needed quite a few fixes. Next up, favorite sports game. That's going to be NFL Challenge. Um, I, I really, for what it is as a sports simulation game, as like you get to be the coach, it's really hard to beat NFL challenge. Like I, even to this day, I'm not sure how many games there are in that type of genre. So like, feel free to check that out. Uh, honorable mentions, hardball, hardball was good. Matt mania was also good, but they, they weren't an NFL challenge. Favorite strategy game. Once again, also gave that away earlier. Romance of the three kingdoms. Easily the best strategy game we've done to this point. Honorable mention, uh, Theater Europe. Uh, I, I liked the strategy that went with it. It just felt very dated by this point. We've been playing games like that since the 70s. So um, the Theater Europe, good, but Romance of the Three Kingdoms really feels like it was pushing the genre. 
All right, let's go by platform now. Uh, first up, we have favorite arcade game. That's going to be Gradius. Gradius was just, it, it's fun. It's hard, but it's, it's a lot of fun. Honorable mentions for that one, Commando, Hang On, Ghosts and Goblins, Space Harrier. They were all good. Favorite console game, easily Super Mario Brothers. I don't even have honorable mentions. Like, no, nothing else was close. Super Mario Brothers, best console game of the year. Uh, was that the only console game that we played this year, actually? Uh, no, there were other there were other console games, but easily Super Mario Brothers, and nothing else really came close. Favorite computer game? I'm still biased. Where in the world is Carmen San Diego for me? I, I love it, I, and I know that it's not for everybody, but it's it's my favorite, so that's why I'm calling it my favorite computer game. Uh, honorable mentions, King's Quest II, Oregon Trail, Deja Vu, Romance of the Three Kingdoms, Ultima IV. They're all solid games. Most of the best games, I feel, came from the, the computer platforms this year. Except my favorite game for the year is Super Mario Brothers. It had to be Super Mario Brothers. Like, I had a lot of fun playing it. It holds up well. There's still some difficult elements, but ultimately Super Mario Brothers is going to be my favorite game of the year. All right. Uh, other awards. Uh, I only have two that I have uh, here to mention. Uh, the Golden Joysticks Award. It goes to the best British computer game. That went to Way of the Exploding Fist. Right. I always kind of want to talk about what people were saying at the time. For me, Way of the Exploding Fist is not the best British computer game that year. Um, I think Mercenary was better. Uh, a lot of the games were better. But that's what they gave it to. And then uh, Computer Gamer, for the best coin-op game, basically an arcade game, they gave it to Commando, which I understand. I get it. I disagree. I think Gradius is better. But Commando is a solid option. All right, so uh, let's do some brief. Do you want to be on camera? No, just wants just wants to be scratched. Okay, uh, let's before I look ahead to 1986, let's do the uh, the personal update, and I'll try to make this relatively quick because I know it's not for everybody. But um, I have been busy. Uh, very, very busy, which is why I ended up having to take a break, I think, right before the Bard's Tale. Just like I needed, a, I needed like a week off, uh, which is about all I had. Um, so lots of things going on in my personal life. Um, the, the big one, obviously the hair. Uh, no, but nobody's addressed it. So I feel like I should I bring it up at some point. It looks all right. Yeah, um, I've never had it this long before. But uh, Han and I are engaged. I have my ring on already. Uh, we got engaged uh, about a year ago. It's been a while. Um, our, our wedding is uh, going to be October 2025. So still a ways off, but maybe I don't talk to you guys before then. I'm going to try, but we will see. Um, so that we've been planning that. That's been busy. That's been making me busy. Uh, I still have my full-time day job. I work at a CPA's office, if you guys were unaware. So tax season was rough. I was playing Ultima 4 throughout all of tax season. Uh, but then the aftermath was also difficult for me. So that was Romance of the Three Kingdoms and the Bard's Tale. But uh, finally got uh, caught up on work maybe two or three weeks ago. So we're good there. But on top of my day job, I also work as accountant for my own clients for my own business. Um, so that's also been uh, something that's been eating up a lot of time. Um, I will say that my own business has really been picking up. And should I get one or two new clients, which I might be able to do pretty soon, um, I might be able to quit my day job. And should that happen, uh, you'll see more videos from me. Um, you know, working 40 hours less a week is very beneficial to uh, my hobbies. And this is still a hobby for me. So um, it might make things go faster there. Um, but I don't want to promise anything. 
And I don't want to promise streams or anything like that right now. We just kind of have to wait and see. And then on top of all of that, uh, Han has opened up a brick and mortar cheese shop here in Portland. If you're in Portland, feel free to stop by. Uh, there's not too many of them. You'll, you'll be able to figure out which one it is. Um, and I have been helping a lot with that. Um, that's been eating up uh, a lot of weekend time, a lot of night time. Uh, so between those four things, right, the wedding, uh, my day job, my business, and uh, Han's cheese shop, I've been very busy. Um, the hope is that if the, you know, if, if everything turns out the way that we would like, I will start having a lot more free time. And should that happen, I will dedicate more time to the videos and try to get them through them a little bit faster. I don't want to sound like, oh, just knock them out and get through it. But, you know, I would like to be able to get through a year of video games in less than a year. And I think this was the first time that that did not happen. So I'm looking forward to uh, being able to maybe do three videos a week or four videos a week and... Uh, be able to do longer sessions with um, some of the longer RPGs and strategy games and things like that. Uh, but right now, uh, I'm probably the busiest that I've ever been. And so we will we'll just have to wait and see how that goes. So that's kind of the personal update. I try to keep it short and brief, but that's basically what's going on. All right, so let's look ahead to 1986. It's yeah, it's it's a big year again. They're all going to be big years from this year forward, but some years are bigger than others. I feel like 1985 is a little bit bigger than 1986. I don't know. We'll go through it and we'll look. So things are just going to start going up and up and from here, right? We're starting to see a recovery from the video game crash of 1983. So we're going to track that as we keep going. Once again, I will do a retrospective video. I'm not quite sure when that's going to happen, but um, 1985 just wasn't the right time for it. Uh, once again, I had to be stricter about which videos I was making. Um, I, I cut a lot of things off, uh, particularly war games and flight simulators. There's just so many of them. Critics seem to love every single last one of them. I, well, they love probably about 75% of them. Um, so it's just like, I don't know. From the outside perspective, it just kind of feels like this is just the same thing, but a different plane. And th there's just so many of them. Um, this year, 1986, there are games that I'm familiar with, and in some cases, games that I have played before that are now becoming honorable mentions. They're not going to be featured as full-length videos. Uh, that's just because there's so much in the landscape that a lot of stuff gets hidden. And so when, it, when that happens, it becomes an honorable mention. I still want to bring it up, but I'm not going to kind of do a deep dive into it. Uh, but typically, this is because the game's just not as impactful, important, or frankly as good as I thought. But each game is its own case. There's a reason, like, this one didn't make it is not going to be the same reason that this one didn't make it. Um, if I do get back to streaming, and that's, that's an if, right, um... Maybe I will go through the honorable mentions and start playing those again. Uh, I did enjoy doing that on the streams. Although, once again, new system. So we'll have to figure out how, how that works and maybe set up a whole new setup for streams at some point. Um, last thing, starting in 1986, some of the sales numbers are going to get pretty crazy. We've been talking about games in the tens of thousands um, and hundreds of thousands, we're going to start seeing bigger numbers than that. Um, I had to make a rule that sales figures alone weren't enough for me to play a game, but it's still a major factor in, in whether I do it. Uh, sometimes video games are popular for reasons outside of the game itself. Uh, sometimes it's a licensed game or a pack-in game, uh, but otherwise they're unremarkable, right? Like, Duck Hunt is, is a good game, but it's so popular for other reasons. And we'll talk about those other reasons when that happens. Uh, in terms of numbers, I have, let's see, 10, 18, 
one, three, four, five, six, nine, twenty-seven. Fourteen. Twenty-seven plus fourteen. Forty-one uh topics to talk about this year. So it's still gonna be a big level. We do have one more introduction. It's gonna be another sports one. Once we get through the sports though, we will stick and and we're just gonna assume that you know sports moving forward, and I can always refer back to the intro video. But that is going to do it for this retrospective. I have been Baller Scuba and I have been talking for far too long. My dog keeps on telling me that. So we're going to cut it off here. I've been Baller Scuba. This has been Video Games Over Time. I've been Baller Scuba, by the way. I still wore the shirt, even though you can't see it. Uh, this has been Video Games Over Time. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in 1986.